As we enter into the Christmas season, I think it is uh, a good time to talk about stories, to describe sort of pastorally where we are, where the Senate is. So I have a story today I'd like to tell you about how the Senate works or doesn't work. And so it came to pass that the filibuster was dismembered, dishonored, and indefinitely detained. With the end of the filibuster came the end of any semblance of comity and compromise on Capitol Hill. The party that never cared much for the rule of law broke the rules of the Senate to change the rules. Senate rules for nearly two centuries allowed the filibuster. The filibuster was simply a requirement that that 60 percent of senators must approve nominations and legislation. This supermajority requirement actually fostered more centrist solutions and compromises. In order to change the rules, though, and kill the filibuster, it required a two-thirds majority to change the rules. However, the party that doesn't and hasn't concerned themselves with the rule of law simply broke the rules. When the chair said that's against the rules, they said, we don't care if it's against the rules. The rules are whatever we say the rules are. The best way to put this in perspective, you're watching a tennis match. The ball is clearly a foot out of bounds. The umpire says out of bounds. Instead of going by the rules, you have everyone vote. So the audience at Wimbledon votes that it was in bounds when it was really out of bounds. That's what we have here. We have no more rules and we have no more comity. We have no more compromise. What we have is poison, poison that's been given to us by people who have no concern for the rules. Historically, this has always required two-thirds of Congress to change the rules, two-thirds of the Senate. But for the first time, we break the rules to change the rules. So in the parliamentarian rules to Senate Democrats, that you're breaking the rules, they say, no, it really wasn't out of bounds, it was in bounds. Or we don't care that it was out of bounds, we don't care what the rules say, we went our way, we're impatient, we want our nominations and we want them now. We don't care about the history of the Senate, we don't care about the history of the Congress. We want our way or we will pick up our toys and we will go home. We want it now. We want it now. We want all of it. We don't want to talk with the other side. We don't want compromise. We don't want discussion. We don't want negotiation. We want our way or the highway. The rules, it seems, aren't binding upon the Senate Democrats. To them, the rules are living, breathing, evolving, and apparently optional. We shouldn't be the surprised though. We shouldn't be surprised that a party that believes in a living, breathing, ever evolving, whatever you want it to be constitution, that they might not think the rules of the Senate are important. We shouldn't be surprised that the party that believes that morality is unfixed, unhinged, unchanged, unchained to any constants, that all ethics are situation that this party might break the rules. We shouldn't be surprised. Is anyone really surprised that a party with no apparent concern for the burden of debt that they are placing on every American family, that such a party would break the rules to get their way? We are told that they are upset that the Senate just takes too long. They want their way and they want it now. They want their people nominated. They don't want to talk to the other side. They won the election, they want their way. So now they have, they've bullied and brayed and they've won the day. The iron-fisted rule of the rule breakers has now begun. There will be no return. Are they going to return to the rules halfway, partway? No, I predict they will only go further. If they don't get their way, they don't get it quick enough, I predict they'll break the rules further. What passed for gridlock before this will pale in comparison to the poison that seeps from the hands of those who are careless 
and reckless with the law. Where the filibuster once created conversation, the iron-fisted rule of the rule breakers will stifle it. For you see, contrary to popular belief, the filibuster actually fostered compromise, dialogue, and often results. In exchange for the release of nominations, in the exchange for the cooperation of the minority party with the majority party, often there was votes on legislation that not everybody wanted. There was discussion, there were amendments, there was dialogue, because we were forced to talk to each other because one side couldn't always get what they wanted. They couldn't slam their fist down in angry tantrum and say, my way or the highway, we want what we want. We don't care what 50% of America wants or what 47% of America wants. We want our way and we want it now. The tantrum used to not work, but now we will live in an era where the iron-fisted rule breakers will throw their tantrum and they will get whatever they want. Contrary to popular belief, the filibuster led to dialogue. Every week, the majority party talked to the minority party. There was a meeting each week in which, in which the agenda for the week was set through dialogue and discussion and compromise. Behind the scenes, not always out in public, but there was discussion and compromise every week because the majority party could not rule with an iron fist. But now in the era of the iron fist, in the era of the iron-fisted rule breakers, why will there be any discussion? Why not just roll over the opposition? Why allow debate? Why have debate? Why have discussion? Why have dialogue? Why have votes? It's been getting less and less and less. As the grip gets tighter and tighter, there's less debate. There's less voting. There's less amendments. And I don't think the American public likes that. I think the American public disavows this place and is unhappy with Congress in general because of lack of dialogue. But that's where we're headed. We're headed towards less dialogue, not more. In the past, Republicans and Democrats would come together. They would agree to votes. They would schedule them for the week. They would agree to dialogue. They would agree to nominations. And they would agree to quick and easy votes for non-controversial nominees. But if there is to be no rules, what incentive is there for cooperation? If it's to be my way or the highway, if the majority party is simply to roll over, if they are to beat their fists, beat their iron fists upon the table and say, my way or the highway, we don't need you. We don't care that half the country is, uh, disagrees with our policy. It's our way or the highway. If that's the way it's going to be, I think there'll be less dialogue and less compromise. Historically, the filibuster encouraged a reluctant president to cooperate with oversight from the Congress. This isn't a Republican or a Democrat thing. This is about the separation of powers. This is about the checks and balances to power. This is about a president who might say or not say whether or not he would kill Americans with a drone. This is about using the filibuster to get information from a reluctant president. This is about a filibuster that allowed Congress to get information to say and to force a president to say, I will not kill Americans with drones. This is about a reluctant president being asked, will you detain Americans? Can you put an American in jail without a trial? Can you send an American to Guantanamo Bay? How do we get those answers from a president who is reluctant to answer? Through the filibuster. The filibuster is an empowerment of Congress. It really isn't Republican versus Democrat. The filibuster is about Congress having power over the presidency or having power to counterbalance a presidency. Information about malfeasance or transparency can be pried from a president in exchange for nominations. Quite typically, holds on nominations were used to get information were used to force people to testify. Recently, I had questions for the nominee for Homeland Security. I asked him, does the Fourth Amendment apply to third party records? This is a big question. It's a big constitutional question. And there are answers. I might not have agreed with his answer. He said he had no opinion. He had no legal opinion on the Fourth Amendment. I asked him, can one 
warrant. Can one warrant from a secret court apply to all telephone records? Can every American who has their records with a phone company have their records looked at through one warrant? Is that consistent with the Fourth Amendment? And this nominee said, yeah, I really don't have an opinion on the Fourth Amendment. Really haven't thought that much about the Constitution. But he's going to lead one of the largest agencies in our government that may well have to do with spying on Americans and yet has no opinion on the Fourth Amendment. So what would the filibuster do? Historically, the filibuster would stop his nomination. What would a hold do? Would it be petulant? Maybe at times. But for the most part, holds were placed on nominees that wouldn't answer questions. So if you wanted answers from nominees, you didn't want them to get up there and say, I don't recall 49 times, or I can't remember, or I don't have an opinion today, sir, on the Constitution. You would hold their nomination. You would hold their feet to the fire. The filibuster holds about slowing things down. This is about the separation of powers. This is about the checks and balances. Currently, we have a president who apparently thinks he's more than a president. He thinks he has a few monarchical powers. He believes more that he's a monarch than he is a president because he thinks he can amend legislation. 20 times, more than 20 times, Obamacare has been amended after the fact. They don't come back to Congress. So what would the filibuster do? What would a hold do? It would say to that president, you will obey the Constitution. We have no way really to get him in court on these things. It's very difficult to prove the constitutionality or disprove it by a challenge. But the, the beauty of our founding fathers was that they separated the power. So one of the powers of Congress is the filibuster. It is placing holds. And by doing that, we check a rebellious or an adventurous president or a president who thinks he can take this power upon himself. Montesquieu, who was one of the people we looked to about the separation of powers, once wrote that when you allow the legislative power to gravitate to the president, when you allow the president to take this power and he can legislate or do whatever he wants, you're allowing a tyranny. That's why Montesquieu wrote that you had to separate these powers so no one body of people, no one grouping within government would assume or absorb too much power. That's what's happening here by giving up our power for petty partisan reasons. Let's be really frank with each other. The Senate Democrats have for petty partisan reasons taken away the power of Congress, taken away one of the checks and balances on a rogue presidency. These checks and balances are not something that really should be, we should stoop to the level of petty partisanship over. By allowing us to do so, what has happened is we've allowed ourselves to give up one of the great checks and balances that were one of the beauties of our Constitution. The loss of the filibuster, I think, truly weakens Congress, and it makes the executive, regardless of, power, of party, more powerful and less likely to be transparent.